So welcome everybody to the to the Spotted Lanternfly uh, webinar. My name is Joanne Allen. I'm the Forest Pest Branch Chief for Forest Pest uh, Management Branch. And today we're bringing you a webinar on Spotted Lanternfly. This is a partnership with the the NCR PRISM and Invader Detectives. Um, Invader Detectives, their hope is to have monthly webinars, trainings on early detection, early detection species like uh, spotted lanternfly. So today, and during today's webinar, we're gonna have uh, Catherine Layton and Tina DeMariano will be uh, giving the presentation today. Um, I'll be moderating, um, we also have Sarah from the NCR PRISM joining us today. And so um, we'll be around to um, answer any questions and assist with the presentation. Um, if during the presentation you have any questions or remarks, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, so, and we'll try to answer those questions in the chat as best as we can. We'll also uh, bring them up at the end of the webinar. Um, at the end of the webinar, I'll also be posting a poll just to kind of get everyone's take on how you felt today's pre uh, presentation went. So if you have a chance, fill out the poll at the end of the presentation. Uh, Tina and Catherine. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Christina DeMariano. I'm an urban forester for Fairfax, and I'm going to turn this over to my partner, and she's going to go ahead and start. Hi, I'm Catherine, another one of the pests over here in the forest pest section. And let's go ahead and get started and talk about spotted lanternfly. We do have a problem with invasive species, uh, whether they're vegetable or animal. <clears throat> We've got them coming in from everywhere and they're just being moved by people uh, whether they are aware of it or not. Um, we've imported them, we've transported them, we've uh, had them hitchhike, we've had them unknowingly coming in on stuff that we move, and um, they just go wild because they do not have their natural predators and bacterium and all kinds of things that would normally be working uh, against them in their native land. So uh, we've also handled them differently according to what they are. Kutsu, it's been whacked away. It's been grazed on by sheep and goats. Um, lots of herbicides have been used. They're still hunting the um, pythons down in Florida. Uh, starlings, a lot of people don't even know that they are not native because there's so many of them. They might as well be. Um, some of them are actually quite tasty. Uh, if we can get past the way snakeheads look uh, and the word carp, which we consider a non-edible fish, uh, actually those are delicious as are nutria I've heard and pigs of course go well, you know, way back, they're good. And with our spongy moss, um, we can say that mother nature gave us a big hand after we sprayed the heck out of thousands of acres of trees to save them finally a naturally occurring fungus from where the uh, caterpillar originated back in Europe, uh, it established itself and has been keeping them under control. So there's a story with each of them. And today we're gonna focus on the story of the spotted lanternfly. So I, I did a quick Bing and Google thing on news for the spotted lanternfly and pulled up these random uh, headlines uh, and you can see reading these headlines that the media really uh, does like to get your adrenaline flowing, get those little fear things going. And uh, I just love that picture of the giant uh, spotted uh, lanternfly that's going to eat the city. Um, so as we worry about what they're going to do, we're going to spend a little time together and look at what they really do do and what we know after they have been now in the States for a little while. And certainly Pennsylvania has a lot of experience with them. 
we're going to identify them and learn how to report them if we find them or when we find them. We'll learn a little bit about spotted lanternfly uh, and then about some of the control options that there are and the quarantine that's in effect in certain areas, what that's all about, what it means for us. And just to make it fun, we're going to throw in a few quizzes and myth or truth questions uh, just to learn a bit more about it. So this is a spotted lanternfly egg mass. It can look like a blob of mud, but as you can see from the side of it, it's not huge, but uh, it's about an inch and it can have 30 to 50 eggs in it. So it's quite potent for the next year when uh, the spring comes and uh, hatching starts to take place. You can find those in a lot of different places. They will be laid on anything around uh, anything, metal, wood, uh, your vehicles, trailers, campers, uh, your kids' playthings in your yard, um, picnic tables. Uh, they're really non discriminatory. And the one on the right, you can see real well how different they can look, but they're all basically gray. Uh, that one in the middle has a shiny cover over it. The others have the eggs exposed. Hmm. Oops. When the eggs hatch, we come to the first instar. These are really tiny. I mean, you may have to look really carefully or even use a hand lens to see the white spots on them when they first hatch. Uh, by the time they're third in star, they're a little bit bigger and you can definitely see all those white spots with the naked eye. I love that picture on the right because it shows those powerful jumping legs that it has. Um, in that picture, it almost looks like he's holding himself back with his front legs like getting ready to let loose like he's on a spring and those powerful legs are just gonna launch him. Um, so yeah, they're great jumpers and they do have sucking mouth parts um, and they look for their preferred plants as they go through their instars to feed themselves. This is the most dramatic change they make uh, when they move into the fourth instar. Uh, if you're like me and you appreciate geometric, colorful shapes, this one is an amazing insect. I, I think it's pretty cool. And um, by then it's uh, fairly large, you'll definitely see that. <laughs> no missing it. And that is the last in star that will be before it goes into the adult stage. You can find those uh, basically April through August. So uh, we are giving everybody the heads up that very soon you'll be able to start seeing these wherever egg masses may be found. This is the adult. They're excellent climbers and they also hop and fly. Their flying isn't particularly powerful for long distances, but with a good headwind, they can actually cover a lot of territory, much like cicadas that kind of fly from this uh, thing to the next, they sort of can uh, land uh, wherever and, you know, kind of clumsily land in your face. Um, so that's what you can expect from them. And in large numbers, it can be quite annoying. Um, and those can be found basically July through November. And they do overlap with uh, the late in stars of the, um, the nymphal stage. So at some point, you may actually see the nymphs and the adults at the same time. The spotted lanternfly has a special relationship with Tree of Heaven. Um, it's its very favorite host, and that's because both of them come from China originally, so it's a long-standing relationship they have. Uh, it, and so the, the spotted lanternfly absolutely adores this tree. It's its tastiest morsel. And um, so both of them are highly invasive in the US because as we said before, they really don't have 
uh, a lot of predators or parasites or anything really, you know, holding them back. And they're prolific breeders. They, there's little egg masses, little, you know, yeah, I'd say 50 times their population from one year to the next for each insect. So the photo on the left, you see the um, spotted liner have congregated on this tree of heaven. That is the typical bark of the tree of heaven. It's kind of smooth like an elephant, but it's mottled. Um, then in the middle, you see the tree of heaven growing uh, in just a crack. It doesn't need a lot. It's the kind of tree that uh, grows like a weed wherever there's an opportunity for it, wherever there's a, a little, little soil. That one in the middle is a female. You can see its flowers. And the one on the right has grown in an empty lot, looks like, um, and it may be a male, but Tree of Heaven can reproduce by root uh, sprouts as well. So they can actually clone themselves all around and make their own little grove of Tree of Heaven. Quiz time. Does a spotted lens? Lanternfly need Tree of Heaven to reproduce. You can put your answer in the chat. Just for fun, just give you a couple of minutes here. On the photo on the left, what it is is uh, an adult uh, spotted lanternfly actually uh, emerging from its last in star in nymphal stage. Um, and it is on a spot, of, uh, what am I saying, on a um, tree of heaven. You can see the characteristic notch on the leaves of the tree of heaven. Uh, that's one way you can tell a tree of heaven. Uh, you can also tell by ripping off one of the leaves and giving it a sniff and it, smell, it smells like burnt peanut butter. It's tree of heaven. And on the right side, there again, they've congregated on a tree of heaven. And um, they, they, it is a magnet for them. So do they need them to reproduce? Oh, Let's wait, just, just a moment. Um, uh, jo Joanne, could you please post the links that you posted at the beginning of, of the chat? Could you do that again? Because a lot of us cannot see them. Can do. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Has everybody had time to uh, post their answers? Let's take a look. Yeah, most, most people are saying no. Aha, uh -huh. cool. You're right, because it is a myth. Um, while it is true that the tree of heaven is a magnet for them, it feeds on and reproduces on many other woody plants. It really does like maple in the absence of tree of heaven. And uh, grape, grape vines, which are uh, wild or cultivated. That's another one of their favorites. So good job. This is as close to current as we can get um, without what we just heard about, all the new little spots that have come up. Um, it began in Berks County in Eastern Pennsylvania in 2014, and it has spread since uh, in all directions to adjacent states. And you can see where it's popping up in other counties, not real close <laughs> to where other populations are. And that's a testament to how well they hitchhike and get moved around. Here's a quiz for you. Spotted lanternflies will kill your yard plants and trees. Myth or truth? I'll give you a minute to put your answers in. They can become in very high numbers at times wherever they are spreading. And they're not always evenly spread on the different um, different uh, vegetations. It's like they can be on a favorite tree, for instance, in high numbers and not in high numbers on others. So 
Have you had a little time to put your answers in? We'll take a look. Yeah, you have a real mix of answers this time. Ah, thanks for letting me know. I am not monitoring the chat while I do this. So thank you for telling me. That's that's awesome because this this is one of the myths that's gone around that sounded really plausible. Uh, and uh, uh, so SLF will feed on many different plants uh, through their nymph and stars, and they have their preference for every stage they are. So they'll move. They'll move from one thing to the other. Uh, and they rarely kill the plants. Um, they can stress them some, but they rarely kill plants. Uh, interestingly, they have killed Tree of Heaven, their favorites, uh, and some grapevines. Uh, vineyards have had some problems, but not all of them have experienced uh, vineyard uh, vine wipeouts, uh, just some of them have. Uh, it's especially a problem when they are in high numbers for consecutive years on the same plants. Also, they don't sting or bite, and they won't harm your pets or your house. They may congregate on your house, uh, but they are not actually eating anything or harming it. Uh, when it comes to pets, as with cicadas, if your pet eats them, they may feel sick or they may throw up, and, uh, but it's generally not considered dangerous for them. Of course, if your pet is acting really sick, you should take it to the vet and see what's wrong with it. So what do they do? Well, after a you know, few years of experience, we know exactly what they do um, at certain places. And, and, uh, like aphids, they use their piercing sucking mouths to suck plant juice. So what goes in must come out and what comes out we call honeydew. It's sticky and sweet. So it attracts ants, wasps, flies, and bees. It falls from the, uh, from the spotted lanternfly's bottoms onto whatever is beneath. So it'll coat the leaves of the tree, the bark of the tree, uh, anything that is under the tree, do not park your cars under the tree. Um, your, your yard things may get really messy. Um, uh, sooty mold will grow on that honeydew, and uh, then that turns it into a lovely gray black muck. Um, so it's, it's not pleasant. Uh, it won't necessarily kill your plants, but um, when the sooty mold is especially thick, it can weaken and damage the plants. Um, so it's not ideal, but it's not a death sentence either. Uh, but it may make your yard really not a pleasant place to be in. You may not actually be able to use your picnic area or your patio for a while while they're doing their thing. How to report them. Um, depending where you live, you want to choose the right place to make your report. Uh, no matter where you report, it'd be really nice if you could send a photo or catch a sample of the insect in a container of rubbing alcohol for a verification. So your local cooperative extension service uh, is one. In Maryland, you have uh, an email address there. In DC, DDOT is there for you. And in Fairfax, you really have your choice. Um, you have your local extension office phone number available there, and our forest pest branch is always happy to help. And we do have our own pest mail uh, email account, so you can uh, attach pictures and send us your reports there as well. And now I'm going to hand it over to Tina, and she will tell you all about control. Thank you, Catherine. She did a really lovely job. So hopefully you guys will not be disappointed in mine since I'm not as knowledgeable as she is. But here we go. Um, so um, report and control is where we're gonna kind of start. Um, Catherine gave a great background on what it likes, its life strategies, uh, what it likes to feed on. And I'm just gonna kind of do a little bit more about if you see, if you see it and uh, what to do about reporting. And I, I really do like this, uh, one that when she was commenting about the first three instars, you see the first three black ones, they definitely go through a bit of a 
a size. There's a definite size difference. And um, you will have crossover between the last instar and when the adults emerge. So there may be times that you um, will see both. We're gonna kind of drill it home that if you don't know or you're not sure what you're looking at to please reach out to us. There's our PEST um, email where you can send pictures or questions. And for reporting, what we really want to also drive home is to use iNaturalist or EdMaps. Um, it's a very useful tool that you can, if you suspect something, you can post it on there and people will kind of help confirm or deny what you're seeing. Um, so again, as you move forward and you learn more and more about this pest, it's a very, uh, it's a great resource uh, in case you don't know what you're looking at. Um, so it's definitely something that it, I would download and take a look at for, for help reporting. So again, um, the, first, the first thing we wanna do is make sure we're looking at the correct pest. So again, we have some lookalikes in our area. For instance, um, here in the blue circle is the adult spotted lanternfly. You can see that the, uh, the hind wings have a very vibrant sort of red color to them. And the tiger moth on the bottom left is a native, but it also does have sort of that vibrant um, hind wing. So again, you have to be, to kind of know what you're looking for. And then also here, the bella moth on the right also sort of has just an eye catching color to those hind wings. So you definitely, again, utilize your resources to make sure that it is spotted lanternfly that um, you are seeing. Typically too, it's one of these scenarios where we do get calls about seeing one and that's not normally how it goes. If you see one and you step back from the area that you're at, whether it's a tree or a picnic table, you're gonna go from seeing one to seeing dozens to seeing hundreds. You're gonna see an infestation. You're not just gonna see maybe one moth kind of flying around and that's just kind of its life strategy. So again, just educating, educating yourself on, um, on the pest. So um, another quiz, um, you're trying to utilize your, your back porch and you, you have your uh, pressure washer, is that enough? If you pressure wash the spotter and lantern flies, is that enough to um, take care of the problem for you? So if you could just drop uh, a couple of them uh, in the chat, what, what you think, what you think if that's a good enough management strategy for spotted lanternfly eggs. All right, I'm okay. seeing it. People don't think so. Okay, good. Myth, uh, washing or knocking the eggs will, won't guarantee that the management practice is, is effective. Um, so what we would suggest is using some sort of sturdy plastic, whether you're getting it off a tree or something else, sort of um, scrape them and uh, put them in a container with rubbing alcohol or sanitizer or something that's gonna actually break down the egg masses. Also too, I say that if you're having a bad day and you wanna get out some tension, you can just step on them and squish them if you sort of knock them to the ground and really twist and turn and break down those egg masses. That'll help ensure that you, you've stopped um, that generation from coming out. So you do have to be um, thorough and aggressive if that's, if that's what you, uh, you want to do with concerning egg masses. Um, I'm just going to touch on uh, control for the homeowner since Tree of Heaven is a tree they do like. They, um, we could do a whole other training on Tree of Heaven, but I'm just going to sort of touch base that you, as a homeowner, if you Again, it won't stop SLF from coming to your yard, but it won't, it won't be as appealing. So as you see here on the left, you have Tree of Heaven sprouting out of um, a simple little crevice in the pavement. And so what you would try to do is before it, it really establishes, be able to try to hand remove it. Um, that way, like uh, Catherine said, it won't kind of populate that area and kind of proliferate. So if you can get it early, that's good. The, uh, the picture on the right shows a much larger specimen that um, would take a little bit more management. You would have to remove it and consider applying herbicides because it will sprout um, after cutting. So it would have to be a little bit more of an aggressive strategy to remove a larger, more mature tree uh, from your, pop uh, your property. 
So I'm, again, I'm just gonna touch base on, just like spot or lanternfly, you can also track tree of heaven um, populations using iNaturalist and EdMaps. So again, I'm just gonna touch base that on the right is a tree of heaven. Um, it has smooth, smooth edges and sort of that kind of pronounced little area at the back of the leaf. Typically the uh, native plant that people think or can get confused by is sumac. We have native sumacs that sort of present like that. Um, sumac has serrated leaf edges. I feel that if you kind of rub them, they have like a lemony, almost citrus smell. Whereas Tree of Heaven definitely has a much more, if you were to crush it, um, a much more, yeah, burnt peanut butter, maybe not so fragrant smell. And again, if, if you're walking around or you don't know what you have in your yard, you could use these tools as well to see if you have Tree of Heaven or if you do have like a native uh, sumac in your yard. Again, this is something that um, will just help, these tools can help you be more knowledgeable um, in, in tracking the lanternfly and the host tree. Um, control. So this gentleman here, um, it's again, when and if you do find it on your property, it is gonna be one or two, it's gonna be dozens or hundreds. So the quickest way to at least get that, con that population under control so that you don't have to worry about the honeydew and the sooty mold all over your area is we recommend just using a shop vac, put a little water and soap at the bottom, and then just start sucking, sucking them up all over. Because again, you're going to see many of them. And the best way for you as a homeowner to take care of it, this will be the most effective, quick time and, and uh, for you to, to, to sort of get in front of that population. Okay, so another quiz time. Um, Batman and Robin like to antique and they went to Burke, uh, Berks County in Pennsylvania. And they know about the spotter lantern fly and they want to be good environmental stewards. So before leaving uh, the county, they are going to inspect the Batmobile before returning to Gotham. So I'm going to ask you to try to locate um, all the different SLF in their different life stages that Catherine went over and put it in the chat. And if you feel that you're a real expert, put which life stage of each did you find? So I'm definitely gonna give you a little time because this is a little bit harder than you think. So I'm just gonna still give you guys a little bit of time because I really gotta look hard because there's so many different life stages and sizes. So far, people are guessing seven, eight. We got one nine. Oh, we got one ten. Ooh, all right. Gold star for the ten. I know. Oh, so. oh, gold star indeed. I like it. Okay. So, all right. So, ten is correct. Ten. Three egg masses, three nymphs, and four adults. Granted, you, you aren't going to see them all at the same time, but to get that kind of ecological recognition of each stage, I think is important. Because if you do go or come from a place of, of an infestation, you can encounter all of these during, um, during the year. So again, um, the Joker said, spoiled my plans again, Batman. Can, um, can, you go, can you go back to the, yeah, oh, see, I didn't. I completely missed the egg masses. You got me. <laughs> oh, good. Well, no, I don't mean I don't mean good. I'm just saying that's the idea that we're we're here to learn. We're here to learn about all the different um, things. And in here, I'll point out, yeah, those are three egg masses. And so again, they they can they move quickly. They can proliferate. So it is again, you just time and time again, you're gonna learn what these what these guys look like. So I'm just going to move on to uh, the, the quarantine, um, other things to help prevent the spread. So like I said before, on the Batmobile, it was only on the outside, but they can be in the wheel well. They can be under your hood. They can be in the chassis. So to hitchhike, they, they don't just have to be on the vehicle. They can really sort of uh, work all parts of your vehicle. So you have to become, again, eyes of what you're looking at when you're looking at your vehicle. 
Um, the other thing is uh, there are businesses using good uh, best management practices where you need to be a permitted holder to move your product and that you were gonna check your vehicle and make sure that your product is, uh, does not contain any spot or lanternfly if, when you're moving things back and forth. So um, a permit is needed uh, to, for, for that. Um, other things you can do um, is don't move firewood. We suggest that you, um, you burn it where you find it. That way you're not transporting similar to EAB. Uh, if you're gonna use it, utilize it there. Um, also too, uh, I think Catherine brought up this middle pi uh, picture has egg masks can be deceptive. They come in different, if there's a coating to it or if they're naked. So this again is gonna be something where you're gonna have to sort of educate yourself and know that it's not something straightforward. So again, being mindful if you are gonna move things, what you are looking for at what time of the year also. Um, and then, you know, again, just becoming an expert on when and where. So this is kind of uh, what I say when and where. We have here when you would find um, eggs and when what instar and adults are lined up here on the bottom. So it kind of gives you a nice general overview of when and when to look for what. Um, I'm happy to uh, provide these. This is what we're going to put out um, this uh, summer into spring uh, all around the county for people to get educated and reach out to us if they um, uh, need more information. Um, and I will go ahead and I will drop this again into the chat. Uh, we're just circling back to the, the Virginia Co-op, uh, Maryland Department of Ag, so all this we will put back, I will drop it into the chat while we do some Q&A for more um, uh, information. Again, that's our phone number at, at Pest Mail. And then I'm going to let um, Sarah, you wanna go ahead and chime in and I have your uh, listserv uh, up. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, so we would like to encourage everyone to uh, report the spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven. If you see it, please, please report both of those. Um, we have a, a program where we're training citizen science volunteers. It's called Invader Detectives. And, oh dear, a poll just popped up here. <laughs> I can't see my slide. Okay, let me move it. I can move it. There we go. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in joining the Invader Detectives program, go ahead and shoot me an email at sarah.tangren at dc.gov. Um, and what I will do is sign you up for the listserv. Uh, you can unsubscribe at any time, so it's, it's not a lifetime commitment. Um, and you're going to get some species posts uh, about species, most of which are probably even more unfamiliar to you than the spotted lanternfly because we are looking for early phase invaders as part of an early detection and rapid response effort. Um, you'll also get some webinar announcements like the announcement for today's webinar. And occasionally we have field trips where we go out to special locations where we can unfortunately see lots of early phase invaders. So um, go ahead and sign up if you're interested in that. Shoot me an email. Oh, and do put the word listserv in the subject line. If you, if you want to join in that effort, please put listserv in the subject line. Okay, so I, I guess I'm passing it back to um, Christina or Joanne, perhaps. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, if um, oh, we can leave the slide up for a little bit just to give folks a chance. Um, and um, yeah, sorry, I'm a little flustered. So, yeah, we're going to leave the slide up for maybe a couple more minutes to give folks a chance to copy down the information. In the meantime, we can start answering some questions. So um, I have, there's one that was asked uh, toward the beginning of the presentation, asking if 
spotted lantern fly causes damage to host trees. So um, we, um, I was able to confirm through a couple sources that not only, so spotted lantern fly has been found to damage the host tree, tree of heaven and other host trees as well, particularly when they're saplings. Um, also, they damage other plants like grapevines. So they certainly do damage and kill trees. Um, someone else asked, what other invasive species are we also preventing the spread of? In reference to, um, if we're preventing the spread of spotted lanternfly, what else are we pre preventing the spread of? And, and honestly, um, the actions that, that are taken in preventing the spread of spotted lanternfly is basically the same ones you do for every other invasive. So um, if you travel, if you have uh, vehicles, boats, any sort of mode of transportation and you are vigilant of any seeds, insects, animals, eggs, anything like that, you'd be uh, preventing the spread of lots of different things. Um, so like, for example, firewood is a vector for a ton of different pests. So if you were not to move firewood, then you'd be potentially preventing the spread of various forest pests amongst uh, and, and diseases. Um, and then um, someone else asked, oh, oh boy, okay. Oh, someone else about, asked about recording. So I will be, this uh, webinar is currently being recorded. Um, I'll be working with my, uh, public information office officer and, and other folks to get this posted on YouTube. So once I have that available, I'll share that with Sarah who has all of your contact information and, and share it to you that way. Um, will you recommend using pesticide? Is it effective for the stages? So um, yes. So I, it, it's really just dependent on this, this particular situation of the, of the property owner, but just squashing or scraping eggs is only so effective. So like, for example, um, unless you're willing to scale up to a top of a building or to the top of the tree or, or whatever, you can only scrape so many eggs. And um, this insect is very mobile. And so you can squash as many, as many as you can, but they're not gonna stay in one location for very long. So if you have a difficult to manage property because of a high level infestation or because of high valuable plants, I would recommend the, the responsible use of insecticides. So there are insecticides that, are, that can be used during all life stages, um, the Virginia Cooperative Extension and other resources like the state of Maryland and also um, Penn State have various resources on what materials can be used and how to use those and following the label and all those different instructions. And it has been found to be effective. So um, let's see. Will invader detectives be removing invasives or detecting only? Sarah? You're on mute. Well, that's not helpful. Um, invader detectives is almost exclusively focused on early phase species. So these would be species that most of you would not be aware of at this point in time. And we are focused on detecting them. And the reason we do that is because when you have small numbers of individuals in a small, sometimes a localized area, you have the opportunity to um, eradicate. I kind of hate to use that word, eradicate, but remove them from that area so that they don't then go on to spread throughout North America. So um, spotted lantern fly is, and tree of heaven are a little bit of an exception to that. Spotted lantern fly is still early detection in the sense that it's new to us here in the national capital region. And we want to be prepared for it and we want to minimize the amount of damage that it's causing. 
Tree of Heaven is not early phase by any um, any interpretation of of the word early. <laughs> it's been here for uh, one, two, three hundred years, something like that, and it's very widespread. But the latest research out of Penn State indicates that uh, spotted lanternflies who don't have access to that favorite host plant. Um, they have lower survival through the adult phase, and they only produce one seventh as many eggs. And so we're thinking if we can get mapping the tree of heaven, we can plan removals, which really we should have been doing anyhow, because they're really severely invasive trees. So this would be a good thing to be doing in any event. But by removing them, we may make life more pleasant for homeowners or park visitors, or say, for example, students who use a schoolyard where the kids are gonna be going out on break to play and things like that. And they're just gonna be like swarms of insects and wasps coming um, and slippery patches of mildew. People are falling in this like slippery mildew and some people, you know, get falling related injuries from that. So generally, yes, early phase uh, things that you might not know yet, like Italian arum or incised fumewort. Um, but today, uh, yeah, I know incised fumewort, right? Um, today we're talking about spotted lanternflies and tree of heaven. So that makes that all very unclear. So oh, um, thank you, Sarah. Um, so yeah, we, we definitely encourage uh, people to, to map everything. <laughs> Basically just map everything and then someone will be happy about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, someone asked, what is the status of biological control research for spotted lantern fly? So this past winter, um, a couple of us in the county got to attend a conference where someone was actually speaking on this. So they're appears to be a lot of work, nothing definitive, <laughs> unfortunately, but there's a lot of different options that folks are investigating in biological control. I don't think, nothing is out of the experimental phase right now. This is a relatively pretty recent pest. It was just discovered in Pennsylvania less than 10 years ago. So it takes a while to develop those methods because there's a rigid protocol that you're supposed to follow before you release biological control agents out in the environment for obvious reasons like the mongoose, the cane toad, lots of other examples of what can go wrong if you release something that um, is harmful to beneficial uh, plants and animals. So unfortunately, there's, it's in the works. That's the short answer. Um, Kathy asked, do you know the native range of the spotted lanternfly and how this compares to our weather conditions? So um, I know spotted lanternfly is native to China. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure where in China, but I do know that it's, what's that? Oh, I thought I heard some talk. Um, but I do know that it is an invasive in Korea, in South Korea, which I know shares some of the same climate as us. And they've had it for a bit longer than, than we have. So um, I think I would suspect that if it can survive in South Korea, it has, at least in Virginia, has a pretty good chance of survival. I don't know how far north it can go, though. That, I guess um, that's, that's, um, my, that's an unknown on, on my end. Yeah, it's already well into to upstate New York. Um, and it's been observed in North Carolina. So if you're participating from the national capital region or the Delaware, Maryland, Virginia region, don't think you're gonna get off the hook with that one. <laughs> Let's see. Um, there was a comment about treating herbicide with tree of heaven. So that is the most effective way of, of uh, managing tree of heaven. So if you were just to say, take a large tree of heaven and just cut it down, um, with, it wouldn't take very long for sprouts to start coming up and you may have 
turn that one tree into six different trees. So I would just recommend the use of herbicides. There are uh, various techniques um, that can be done. And I, I definitely uh, am an advocate for restricting the use of herbicides, but in the case of Tree of Heaven, there really are no other alternatives for controlling the tree, or at least uh, time-effective ones. Yeah, Krista, um, Krista Kerrigan, who is with the uh, University of Maryland Extension, has put a link to Penn State's uh, page for people to control Tree of Heaven. Um, and I would just like to share what Joanne said. This is, you know, if you're a homeowner and you're comfortable with using over-the-counter ready-to-use chemicals, then that's an option for you. If you're not comfortable with using chemicals, then consider hiring a contractor. Have a landscape professional do it for you. You, you probably, you may very well have, if you either have contractors already to come work in your yard, if you don't, your neighbors do, um, they can hook you up with someone who can do it. And they're professional and they will use the safest chemicals available and do it in a very targeted, careful way. Yeah, and you can always ask to see their pesticide license. Make sure yes. that it's, you know, uh, current. That's yes. Too, or it's not current. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't hire someone without a license, please. <laughs> um, someone asked if, um, since Fairfax County is surrounded by, you know, Maryland, who has lots of known cases of spotted lantern fly and other counties, around Fairfax County with known populations of spotted lantern fly, is it kind of a given that it is in Fairfax County, that there are spotted lantern flies in Fairfax County? So officially, there are no known populations. Um, where my office works very hard on monitoring and look, keeping, a, keeping an eye out through various techniques um, by you know, putting out, sending out uh, postcards, um, social media posts, various things, and also um, just doing our own monitoring. So as of right now, we don't know of anything. There could be something in Fairfax County, but we can't confirm it, but it's probably very likely. Let's see. Someone asked if SLF is uh, detrimental to native grape. Um, I would assume so, but I don't, I haven't, I, Sarah, you're shaking your head, yes. Yeah, it is, it does. It affects native grape as well. Yes. Yes. Um, do we report tree of heaven to DNR contact? You gave us first lantern fly. So I would say the best method for reporting tree of heaven is using EdMaps or iNaturalist. Um, if someone could post those links, that would be, uh, that would be good. So use EdMaps, use iNaturalist. If you have an account with iNaturalist, join up with Invader Detectives. Um, you can choose either or. You don't have to use both because they're both those both apps are sharing information with each other. So if you share it to one, it'll get to the other one. So. I think that's it. I think. Um, Unless anyone has any other questions, um, we did think it would be kind of interesting. We have a couple minutes. If anyone uh, wanted to add in the chat any experience that they have with spotted lantern flies, so we thought there may be some people here that already that live with spotted lantern fly, and if they have any experience they would like to share, negative, positive, indifferent. Anything like that. Um, so I'm very sorry that I bombed your your uh, your presentation, um, Sarah, with the poll. But I didn't <laughs> but if you can, please uh, fill out the poll. This is we're not super experienced with with uh, with doing Zoom webinars, especially hosting them ourselves at the county, but. Um, yeah, fill out the poll, please. Yeah, I could, um, I could also add um, to what we were saying previously about controlling Tree of Heaven. 
I understand it can take a couple of go rounds, even if you're using chemicals. Um, so it's, it's, unless you're pulling out a seedling, like I think Catherine was telling us, um, it, cutting it, cutting it makes it worse and using chemicals can still require a few repeat treatments. Uh, but I always like to advise if you're a homeowner and you're dealing with tree of heaven, um, that you're either working with a professional landscape service or uh, if you're going to try and do it yourself, you might want to reach out to your local extension. And whether you are in Virginia, Maryland, or DC, you can uh, get that type of advice from extension very efficiently by going to ask an expert. So just go to your, your search engine, probably Google, and type in ask an expert and then type in the name of your state. Um, and there will be a panel of certified professional horticulturalists. They're like literally waiting to answer your questions. And the cool thing about that is you can ask really specific questions that way. Send them a picture of your specific problem. And I see Mark has his hand up. Uh, Mark, you have your digital hand? Yes, uh, I have successfully removed Tree of Heaven uh, a decade and two decades ago in the 200 acre Ruth B. Swan Park in Charles County. And I wanted to share that I used the uh, hack and squirt method to reduce the amount of herbicide. Uh, but with Tree of Heaven, you have to use notches all the way around the tree and that worked. And I, by the way, I, there are healthier sources of glyphosate like Rodeo and Aquastar uh, and Alligator 5.4 than, than the Roundup, so you can get those online. Uh, then I want to say next year, each place I killed the tree and the little stumps from the tree, then about a dozen small ones popped up the next year and only the next year and they're easy to dig out. So come back the second year and get all those little ones that have been waiting and waiting. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. All right. Um, Tina, Catherine, Sarah, was there anything you'd like to add before we conclude? Um, this is Catherine. I just wanted to thank everybody for uh, their interest and for helping with this. And uh, that kind of de facto may, will make you sort of a semi expert on it. And uh, so people will be coming to you for information. I suspect. So I um, just wanted to throw out one more thing that I heard is that uh, folks um, <clears throat> can unknowingly just be confused between what's an herbicide and what's a pesticide. Uh, I've heard of uh, instances where people have uh, taken herbicides and sprayed them on their tree to kill the spotted lanternfly and it did a, a bad thing for their tree. So yeah. uh, also um, using things that are not made for uh, killing the insects safely, uh, just like homemade stuff. And um, so when you're speaking to people, maybe you can help uh, to teach them the safest way to uh, just to uh, handle the, the spotted lanternfly on their property uh, so they know uh, the better way to do it. That's all I had. Thank you so much, everybody. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining. And uh, if I do this correctly, you'll all be emailed a recording, a link to the recording. So I'm going to end the recording right now. But thank you, everyone. I also put the info in the chat, too, for who to contact as well.